Welcome everyone to paper six of our short papers. Lucas Etimo from the University of Nottingham will be speaking on the use of brain-machine interfaces, BMIs, in human and non-human beings. Thank you very much, Lucas. Thank you very much. Um, where does morality come from? Is morality, is morality uniquely human? Different theologians uh, have tried to answer these questions. The majority of theologians claim that morality pertains uniquely to human beings because only rational creatures can perform moral choices. In other words, non-human creatures cannot be moral agents because uh, they lack both intellect and will, which are the two immaterial properties of the rational human soul. In this paper, uh, I will argue that while human beings are uh, moral agents par excellence, the phenomenon of morality can be detected also in non-human creatures, although morality is present only uh, in an embryonic stage. The Thomistic theologian Jim Porter explains that, quote, the story of the natural law uh, tradition is basically, is basically a story of more or less steady progress from obscurity to clarity through the progressive reformulation of the natural law as an independent and rationalistic system. Porter objects to this perspective of natural law and rather endorses a naturalistic ethics in which the natural law is in continuity with the laws of nature imprinted also within the pre-rational human beings. She argues that this was Aquinas' original intuition, given the existence of an intrinsic teleological and intelligible behaviour in all living creatures, both human and non-human. Concerning this point, she writes, quote, the distinctiveness of the natural law stems from the distinctive character of the human person, which implies that she can only attain her proper end through a process of rational choices, informed by some grasp of what the end, of that end might be. At the same time, however, this process is grounded in inclinations which stem from our created nature and reflect the intelligibilities structuring that nature, even in its pre-rational components. Seen from this perspective, the natural law reflects one expression of the more general tendency of all creatures to seek their final end, and in that sense to seek God, in all true activity structured by the natural inclination. In this way, Porter hopes to correct some of the erroneous understanding of natural law, such as the new theory of natural law developed by uh, German Grises and John Finnis and other. Professor Celia Dean Drummond, who delivered the opening keynote in the conference yesterday, yesterday is also somehow consonant with this perspective from Porter. Uh, Drummond uh, shows that uh, there is in fact an important connection between human and non-human morality, and she demonstrates this through her engagement with research on the inequity aversion in primates. And I don't want to repeat what uh, Celia explained yesterday, this will, was also recorded in a YouTube session that you can look uh, later. Uh, Celia uh, Dean Drummond's argument, supported by the scientific findings in relation to the phenomenology of anger and payback in human and primates, is consonant with Porter's claims, which endorse the existence of a relation of continuity between pre-rational and rational nature. My paper aims to bring additional evidence from recent scientific research in relation to BMIs, to show that moral behaviour does not pertain uniquely to human beings, but can be observed also in non-human creatures. Thus, there must be a relation of continuity between human and non-human beings in, in relation to morality. And my perspective supports the view that morality is not exclusively a human phenomenon, and I will also discuss the uh, implication which may affect the theological discourse, discourse on the notion of Imago Dei. The starting point uh, um, of my reflection has uh, been a book chapter uh, written by uh, uh, the Ira Iranian-American scholar Nita Farani, who understands research on the ethical, legal and social implication of emerging neuroscientific technology. Uh, Nita Farani has argued that recent findings in the field of neuroscience, in particular in relation to the use of BMIs, can help philosophers of law to reflect on the free will in connection with moral and criminal responsibility. 
This paper is divided into three sections. First, I will describe Farani's definition of free will, the distinction between freedom of choice and freedom of action. I will present her main arguments, which has been confirmed by different scientific findings in relation to BMIs. It is, uh, according to this scholar, the freedom of action rather than the, than the freedom of choice that accounts for moral and criminal responsibility in human being. Then, the second part, I will reflect on the fact that some experiments using BMIs on monkeys suggest that also this animal possess freedom of action, thus suggesting that morality is not uniquely a human phenomenon, but applies, uh, although to a much less extent, also to non-human creatures. And from this point of view, I differ from Farani because she claims that morality uh, and moral responsibility applies only to human beings. And then I will conclude um, by, by discussing the difference in uh, degree, not in kind, between human and human being in relation to uh, the ability to reason and make moral decision, and discuss the implication deriving from the perspective in, re in relation to the notion of Imago Dei. So Farani built her definition of freedom and free will following the work of the philosopher Harry Frankfurt. She explained that the free will encompasses freedom of choice and freedom of action. She defined freedom of choice as, quote, the freedom over one preference, desire and or dispositions. She then explained that freedom of action represents, quote, the freedom of intending an action, being able to bring it about without obstacles and or impediments and identifying with the action which results. She exemplifies the notion of freedom of choice and freedom of action by describing the behavior of someone who is thinking of eating a cake. Freedom of choice relates to one craving, thus the freedom over one preference and disposition. For example, one might dislike a carrot cake or uh, prefer a chocolate cake. Freedom of choice, however, differs from the freedom of um, uh, freedom of action, however, differ from the freedom of choice in that an individual deliberates through the freedom of action in the decision to actualize their desire. Thus, in this case, the person needs to purchase, to purchase the desired cake, take a fork, cut the cake and eat it. For Farani, the freedom of action is the essential feature which needs to be present in order to establish if an individual is morally responsible for their action. This scholar reflects on the fact that there are patients unable to perform specific actions through the movement of their body parts. For example, there are paralyzed patients who cannot move their arms. However, through the develop development of BMIs, which transmit the information to specific algorithms con connected to, uh, with artificial arm, these patients are now able to perform the action that they think and that they desire to do. Their thoughts can be decoded and transmitted to robotic arm so that this patient, despite the paralysis of their limbs, can fulfill their conscious and deliberate intention by performing the desired action with the artificial arms. The use of BMIs, quote, demonstrate that action choices are distinct choices with neural representation than that can be detected and isolated. Farani observes that once brain implants have been fitted into patients, they will need extensive practice to be able to successfully perform the desired movement of their robotic arms. This is explained by Farani in this passage, which is quite long, but is worth reporting in, in its entirety, because here she describes what has been observed with Tim Hems, who is a paraplegic patient following a car accident, after a BMI chip was applied into his brain. So we read that after the new chip was implanted in Ham's brain, moving the robotic arm was not simple uh, as Ham's thinking, I want to move my arm. Instead, he had to discover how to form the specific intention to move the robotic arm and train for weeks to learn how to do so. He began by training on moving a cursor around a screen, quickly discovering that thinking simple thoughts like move up or move down did not suffice to achieve the action he desires. Instead, he had to learn a new language, a new way of translating the intention to act into the three-dimensional action. This technological feat may explain the difference between disposition, 
intention to act and performance of actions. Hems had to learn to create effective brain states to move the robotic arm, making plain that conscious willing of the action, thus the deliberation through the freedom of action, is a necessary cause of an intentional action. His training goes to the core of whether the brain alone controls action or whether some conscious self exercises control, choice and movement. Hems tried to simply let the brain figure out how to move the, the arm and that approach failed. While Hems' experience of consciously and the deliberating training eventually resulted in effective brain states to signal the robotic arm causing the arm to move in accord with Hems' intention. Hems identified the resulting movement of the robotic arm as its own action. Thus, it's clear that the patient had to spend time to train to perform action so that the, the brain state could create the correct movement of his arm, artificial arm. And, uh, and this shows that the resulting action, for example, a specific movement of the arm, is not simply the output of brain mechanism understood deterministically, for example, in terms of electric impulses or release of neurotransmitters, but the patient action are the result of its free choice. So it's reasonable to affirm that the action performed by this paraplegic patient through BMIs were voluntary action. So it's clear that the BMIs has prove that free will exists and that the brain, our brain is not simple uh, a mechanical machine. According to Farani, a person should be judged as culpable for their action, not simply if they think about carrying out an evil action by deliberating through the freedom of choice, through which we imagine all sorts of idea, but only we should be culpable if we actually execute the action through the deliberation of freedom of action, which enable the implementation of the specific action. So Farani argues that only freedom of action, not the freedom of choice, accounts for the actualization of premeditated action. So the existence of brain implants, which enable human beings to move a robotic arm, show that these movements are the result of voluntary decision, which have been deliberated over through the freedom of action, not freedom of choice. Another uh, example is that we can think or dream of performing specific action, but thinking to do something does not mean that the person is, will actually implement this idea. So we need an extra strap, step in our brain to transfer the decision that we have deliberated through the freedom of choice to the freedom of action. And this is demonstrated by the fact that the paraplegic patient needed time and practice to learn how to create specific states in the brain which were able to move the arm. We will now describe the finding for uh, non-human creatures and we will see the strong similarity with what has been described for, uh, for human patient. It has been demonstrated that BMIs can also enable monkeys to move artificial arm and I argue that this is important to reflect on this issue because there are important theological and philosophical implications on the understanding of moral theories. And what I propose is, again, differs from Farhani's perspective because she thinks that only human beings can make moral choice. However, I claim that a careful analysis of the scientific literature demonstrates that the finding in the experiment of BMIs apply also to, in a similar way to humans and monkeys. So they are quite similar and this, simply, this implies that the distinction between freedom of action and freedom of uh, um, choice should apply not only to human beings but also to non-human beings. So similarly to the case of BMIs uh, for, uh, that we have seen for paraplegic patients, researchers have been uh, able to decode the movement intention of monkeys and there are essentially two steps. First, they need, they need to decode the neural processes which are responsible for the movements of the limbs of the monkey. And second, by using the information to build a BM, BMI which associates the electric impulse to specific movements on the limbs. I would like to comment this uh, picture uh, that you see in the slide. Um, in, in this, this year, in May, a, a new BMI technology uh, was developed in China by Professor Duan Feng at the Nankai University, and this technique is able to decode the electroencephalogram 
signal from the monkey's brain and through the transmission of electrical signals to a device, the monkey is able to control the movement of a robotic arm with their thought. And please uh, uh, note that this artificial arm in this case is not attached to the monkey, it's separate. So there is something immaterial, I believe, going on here because the monkey can actually move the artificial arm with the thought alone. And it should be noted that the monkey, this is important, similar to the situation to uh, paralyzed patient, needed some training before learning to actualize, to actualize the intended movements. Thus, as with humans, the monkeys needed uh, to learn to convert the information from uh, its thoughts through brain states. So only in this way um, the movement can be performed in this case. And uh, in the literature it shows that it took up to 15 days for the monkeys to learn to do this. So this suggests that monkeys use a similar process to humans in order to learn to actualize the desired intention. So this means that non-humans are not simply behaving deterministically, as some people may think, or automatically, but there must be also for them a freedom of choice and a freedom of action. And we have seen that Farani demonstrated that the freedom of action is associ associated with the legal and moral responsibility in human being. But given this similarity between the experiment with monkeys and human, my proposal is that her argument can now be extrapolated and applied also to non-human beings. And the fact that both monkeys and human beings seem to need time in order to learn how to actualize the decision that have been deliberated strongly suggests that it is reasonable to first distinguish between freedom of choice and freedom of action and second correlate freedom of action with moral responsibility not only human beings but also in monkeys. And what I presented seems to suggest that morality is not a uniquely human phenomenon, but it applies at least partially also to non-human creatures. By the way, this is the team that did the operation uh, in this monkey and, um, uh, and got these re results, essentially. So, but net, now let us return to Dean Drummond's reflection from yesterday on the notion of, of payback and fairness in primates in relation to morality. So we could easily imagine a monkey would decide to move an artificial arm in order to get some payback or some revenge from another monkey. For example, who stole his food. And please note that being hit by an artificial arm can be very painful. <laughs> so, and I, I argue that th this possible experimental scenario provides evidence that also monkey possess at least some level of moral agency, so morality in an embryonic stage. And uh, thus, the choice are actualized in monkeys through freedom of action, similarly to human being. Clearly, a human being can of course make moral decisions which may have a much more powerful and tragic effect for the rest of humanity, we could think a man that could decide with an artificial arm to load a bomb with nuclear material and then push a button to launch it with the desire of destroying a city, killing thousands of people. Obviously the, world in, 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 obviously the monkey's notion of morality is much less developed than, than this and a monkey display moral behavior once again, I would say embryonically, uh, probably related to food or social behavior, structure of society that, that they have. But nevertheless, it should be now clear that morality is not a uniquely human phenomenon, but it's present, at, although to a much lesser extent, in non-human creatures. And uh, what distinguishes human and non-human being uh, in terms of morality is a difference of, uh, not a difference of kind, uh, but a difference of degree in the ability to reason and make moral choices. And uh, the last part, in the last few minutes, is the implication for the understanding of the notion of Imago Dei. And uh, I've, what I presented so far, it's, I, I have argued that it's incorrect to insist on the endorsement of ethical theory which absolutizes human reason. Is more concerned, is more, is, is, it is co more correct to affirm that there is an ascending intensity in the phenomenon of morality, 
So as we move higher to a more uh, to higher complex form of life. So there is no doubt that man has created a level of complexity in the way in which he takes decision in relation to his freedom of choice and action. However, we have seen that both this type of both this type of freedom are present also in non-human beings such as monkeys. So while it is undeniable that morality is fully realized and manifest in the human person, the inclination to moral behavior can be identified also in non-human creatures. And my claim resonates with Jim Porter, uh, with uh, what, this, what I showed you before about the inclination, intrinsic inclination imprinted in our creature's nature that reflect the intelligibility, the structure, the nature, even in its pre-rational components. Uh, thus, uh, also a monkey, uh, um, through an, its natural inclination, mediated by the freedom of action, seeks its final end, and in that sense, seeks God, although clearly with a much, much lower ability and intensity when compared with humans. There are some theologians that uh, are consonant with this view, and uh, um, my claim resonates with the theological perspective of Bethany Soledeller uh, when she affirmed that, quote, the deep commonality between human and non-human animals do not eliminate human uniqueness, but they may increasingly turn our definition of uniqueness in one of role rather than of capacity. What notion of Imago Dei should we then adopt, given what we know from the experiment of BMIs? And I believe there are two theologians, uh, Daniel Horan and Joshua Morris, who could help in answering this question. Uh, Franciscan theologian Horan des desire, um, desires, quote, to reframe the Imago Dei to include non-human creatures alongside members of the human species in some forms. He achieved this goal by, quote, the constructing, the constructing anthropocentric privilege and reflecting in particular on the notion of the non-human agency. He, in particular, he involves, he discussed the cognition and the moral reasoning and the emotion uh, that are found not only in human beings, but also in other creatures. Um, the second thinker is uh, Joshua Morris, who propose that instead of grounding the image of God in human uniqueness, we should affirm that Imago Dei is exegetically, theologically, and scientifically best understood in light of Hebrew theological framework of historical erection. A passage in his article summarized well his position. As human beings are the animals, uh, species, historical uh, elected, called and commissioned by God to be his royal representative and priestly servant who strive uh, to accomplish God's will for the world, Human specialness lies not in the content of our characteristic, but in the very fact that the Homo sapiens are the animal species who are both called and chosen in as God's image. In other words, human and non-human beings are similar in the sense that both are uh, created. Uh, however, human beings reflect God's image because, as explained in the Old Testament, they are chosen by God in order to fulfill God's plan. And Morris further expand this point by explaining that, quote, Understanding the divine likeness as election is consonant, is consonant with evolutionary biology conception of human-animal continuity and the genealogical nature of species and also acknowledge non-human animals and hominids as the ontological equivalents of humans and as fellow creatures that are substantially the same. At the same time, though, the Imago Dei as election upholds the attestation of scripture and tradition in exclusively designating the image to human being alone. And the last minute, I want just to show you this miracle of Sant Anthony of Padua. Uh, it's a story of, um, uh, of, a meal in, uh, of a mule that kneel <laughs> in front of the Eucharist. We are at, in the period of the heresy of the Catarism, and there were doubts about the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And as you can see, the mule here revered the Eucharist uh, and actually refused some food and refuse some food and prefer to kneel in front of the Eucharist. And perhaps the message here of this miracle is to show that the natural inclination uh, towards the true, the good, and, and, the, and the beautiful, towards God, is not uniquely human, but is shared also in non-human beings. We, we could also 
think that this miracle can be interpreted eschatologically? Does it mean that the miracle of Saint, Ant of Saint Anthony relieve, uh, showed that also non-human being participate uh, to the beatific vision? If this is the case, that this perhaps would uh, support the fact that animals are uh, partially, at least, moral agent already now. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is another picture. This is the last slide. The just last sentences really so is, is to conclude that I have considered the philosophical theological implication which derive from the use of BMIs in human and non-human being and, arg and I have argued that freedom of action which Farani has demonstrated to account for moral responsibility in human being is most likely present not only in humans but also in non-human creatures and the fact that morality is not a uniquely human phenomenon but is present although to a much less extent also in non-human creatures and this points to the existence of a degree of, of a difference in degree, not in kind, in the ability to reason and to make moral choices when we compare human and non-human beings. And I have argued that, it's, that this perspective is still consonant with the, uh, some theological approaches which describe Imago Dei. Thank you. Fascinating material. Okay, we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, so here's my question. How do you know for sure that this time in between the freedom of choice and freedom of action um, is not characterized by just uh, neurons firing uh, on the robotic arm uh, indiscriminately in order to, uh, to, to cause a certain effect? Um, mm -hmm. So instinctively, as it were, rather than by way of a conscious uh, action or conscious uh, deliberation. Because if you go for this conscious deliberation, that would mean that the content of our thoughts would make a difference to what's actually uh, happening in our brain. So it brings mm -hmm. you back to the Cartesian problem, I would say. Yeah. I've, in answer to your question, I believe that the fact that both uh, monkeys and humans need a lot of time in order to make the idea something which is real, so let's say I'm thinking to do something and I do something, so the fact that between these two stages there is a lot of training seems to suggest that, the, that there is a pathways in between. Uh, we know this already in neurophysiology with the motor cortex which is slightly separate. So there is an idea and then there is all the motor circuits and then we have the frontal part which controls our way we, we choose to, the, the action we do. But the, the, I think what BMIs are telling here is, is the, the proof that there is a, a something in between. The fact it needs time. So you need to retrain the circuits. Sorry? It's, it's not just a process of trial and error. I will, no, I, I, would, I wouldn't think so. Uh, I, I will think that it's, it's something that we need to, to really desire. <laughs> and, and our circuits need to be reconfigured so that that action is taking place. Okay. But I may be wrong, but that's my impression. Question there. Okay, good one, because I, I, sometimes... I, I have nothing against animals, okay, let's start from there. But sometimes I feel that we may be stretching the concept of, um, of moral decision a bit too easily. Because um, for an act, if, when people decide to act in a certain way, it becomes moral when the person is conscious of the principle that he's going against or according to which he is acting. There's a kind of, there's an awareness of a principle. This point is significant even within the human sphere. This is a question I also asked Celia yesterday. Because, you see, if we apply uh, what you were talking about um, even to young children, you see, they act. But sometimes we, re we, re we restrain our judgment or we judge uh, in appropriate ways because the child does not understand yet. So uh, how can we solve this issue? If we extend the idea of moral action to all agency, even non-human agency, it seems that we are stretching the idea of moral act a bit too much. This is my worry. 
Um, why not, I mean, acknowledge that there are uh, voluntary actions even in non-human animals, as there are in children, but yet we should restrain the idea of morality when there is full consciousness in the determination of the act, mm. so that even punishment mm. is accordingly, correctly, as it were, uh, yeah. imposed. Otherwise, you, uh, I think we, you get lost and conceptually confused. Yes. This is my worry. I understand your worry, and uh, uh, it has to do also with the way we see human being in relation to the rest of human non-human creatures, the, uh, the importance we have. And I have just an appendix. Uh, this can, can actually... Uh, actually, this is a, you know them. They are two f famous uh, intellectuals for this school. And both of them are clearly showing a relation of continuity within the non-human world and the human world. Now, if it is true that biology has shown that there is a continuity, it means that the biological, the, the neuropharmacological structure of our brain is similar. Now, uh, this points to the fact that there should be a morality which, yes, is most evident in human being, but I, I cannot see that is complete, completely separated from, from, from the rest. I cannot. Why? Because, you know, take an, also this, this is an area which is important for higher cognitive function. This is the size and this is the different species. And you see that, okay, we have more, right? It's a difference not of type, <laughs> of kind, but of degree. Otherwise, Traditionally, in the, in the Christian theology, we have had this issue that we have the rational beings and, and then all the rest are non-rational. And I know uh, Aristotle, rational, we are rational beings, uh, Aquinas and so on. But then, if these are the data, <laughs> we need to actually think that there is somehow a continuation of, on it. But, and that's why I invoked those theologians but it's a difficult question, and we should still maintain the human uniqueness. But I don't have, a, I guess, a precise answer, but I'm trying to make sense of the scientific data and what we know from uh, the um, We're out of time, but Paul, is it a quick question? Um, I don't know. It's a, a statement, really. I, I mean, it, it, it seems to me that this experiment that you describe mm. with the BMI mm. and the fact that it takes a long time for the brain to interact with the machinery shouldn't surprise you. I don't think that I don't think that gives any information on the on the question that you're posing about morality. I mean that just says it takes a long time for the the brain mechanics. Yeah to operate an arm, whether it's a real arm or a mechanical arm. Yeah. I mean, I foolishly, after 80 years of not having any piano lessons, I've started having piano lessons again. And I can tell you that it takes a very long time mm -hmm. of practice yeah. to get the notes on the music into the fingers of my hands. Yeah. And that's just the same as if I was being taught to control uh, a remote yeah. arm that was connected to my brain impulses. It, mm. tells, it tells nothing I'm not sure. about the moral processes going I'm not, on I'm not in my sure. brain. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. First of all, this argument was done by Nita Farani, so you should address this critique to her because I use her work. But I don't think it's completely correct because there must be at least two phases in our brain before we take an action. Two phases, and I make you an example. If now you stand up, you may think you want to stand up and punch me, right? You think this, but you don't do it. So there must be a phase in which you think and a phase in which you implement the choice that you did punching me. Now, this is phenomenology. There are two phases. The fact that there is a time interval 
shows, in my opinion, that you need to actually desire to put that idea in place, to actualize it. That's how I would understand her work. But perhaps, uh, and, and what is interesting is that non-human beings don't also have this time to think. So it's not that they behave like automatically, like you would do, but they need to kind of also think to do it. It's an hypothesis, but yeah, it could be challenged. This, this is clearly fascinating and quite <laughs> difficult material. So uh, thank you so much, Luca, for taking oh, this. No worries. Thank you. Thank you.